Welcome Wargamers to my first video in my coverage of the Dawnbringers campaign series. If you are new to Age of Sigmar or Games Workshop, new to the hobby really, essentially throughout the course of the Age of Sigmar meta narrative, every once in a while Games Workshop will put out a campaign series where it's a collection of books that tell a story and also have missions to let you and I recreate it. The first example being Realmgate Wars was a multi-campaign long book series, Broken Realms certainly being the most recent example of that. But since we were dropped off into the Era of the Beast, where Kragnos has now ascended and been unleashed upon the realms, and basically the magics of life are making every realm go wild, no more so than Gur. Well, in the midst of that, our story just kinda ended. Like, the, the book Dominion came out and introduced this new setting and then things didn't really progress forward through it. And this book begins to change that, not necessarily by pushing events uh, forward chronologically, but by repositioning the action to a different front that is no less exciting and happening uh, could be just about simultaneously, if not long after the events of the Broken Realm series. So if you haven't listened to that, please go check out my playlist. I have a full week of lore coverage for each video or for each book in that series. I'll leave links to it down below. And so today we're going to introduce the Dawnbringer series, talk about the overarching uh, story arc that we get here. This is going to be a shorter one because the narrative is a little bit different in this book, as I'll touch on at the end here. And before we jump in, I want to just say two things really quick. One, I am turning advertising off on my videos because YouTube is just, it's getting absurd with how many auto ads it puts in if I don't specifically tell it where to. If you wouldn't mind, just please consider using the affiliate links in my description because it really would help make up for that. It doesn't take a lot of money. One affiliate purchase covers about a thousand different views, you, which is just nuts. And it would go a long way to help supporting the channel. And I plan to do that going forward. No more ads on these videos. Not Just Gaming is an awesome story in the US that I recommend that has uh, marked off prices on all Games Workshop and Hobby Supplies. So if there's any project you are looking to do, big or small, go ahead and use that affiliate link and all of it goes to supporting me as a content creator and a local game store that happens to sell things online. Me, my wife, our cats, we all appreciate it. It keeps us going. Thank you so much. And the second thing I wanted to throw out there is I am now part of the Goonhammer Network. So uh, Goonhammer, if you don't know, is an awesome site for getting people into the more, I guess, tactical side of the hobby. Certainly when it comes to giving direction to new players on, on where to go, kind of different builds, what you can expect from different factions. You know, it's basically a whole site of op-ed pieces like a blog, and it's run by some pretty cool people. So go check that out down below. So with all that out of the way... Where did we leave off when it came to the Rumgate Wars? Because this story picks up like immediately afterwards. Like there's not really like a definitive timeline, but the events that are mentioned, we're gonna recap here at Broken Realms, had, had really just recently happened. Well, at the end of the Broken Realm series, let's see, Marathi became a god and struck up an alliance with the Deepkin. That was kind of a forlorn experience. Kragnos, a new god of destruction, was unleashed. Um, Grimnir tried reconnecting with the KO, but it didn't really look that good for him. Alariel started a ritual of life that made the realms go absolutely insane, and now we have, like, uh, realm magic beasts, the incarnates rolling around. Nagash got stuffed into a locker like a nerd. Vindicarum and, um, Excelsis are both basically cities that have fallen. So, Vindicarum was almost, like, deleted from the map. Okay, like just essentially it's it's built into a giant bowl and Zinch demons just wrecked that place. Excelsis is still around much more so. Like it still functions as a hub. It's more literally intact as a city, even though it like had to fight off a whole destruction army. But Vindicarum got wrecked. And Sigmar launched a whole bunch of crusades, known collectively as the Dawnbringer Crusades, in a plot to basically use this resurgence of life magic to their advantage while things are tilting in their favor, go out, spread, and colonize the realms as much as you can. Basically, dig in a foothold. Take the, the land that we have claimed, build a new perimeter, we're gonna push back inch by inch. Now, most of these crusades are, shall we say, of the ill-fated sort. We read one such journey in the book Dominion by Darius Hinks. Highly recommend that one, I very much liked it. But that's just one journey that happened to pan out kind of well. No spoilers on the end there. I'm just going to say with a huge asterisk, kind of well. And if you've read the book, you know how huge that asterisk is. But I'm going to move on. Most of these crusades end in absolute disaster, either getting torn apart by the realms themselves, natural beasts, 
other armies, of course, like being picked apart by orcs. Um, the new type of orc, meaning the, the cruel boy, has emerged from the swampy jungles. They got threats on all sides coming at you. And that's really where the Broken Realms campaign series ends for the most part. There's a little bit of intrigue when it comes to Bellicor and, and Archeon and their plots and stuff like that. That's not really relevant. We're going to put it off to the side. Those are kind of the big end cap events. But in a very unexpected move, this story, moving into uh, Dawnbringers as a book, pivots the, the narrative, I guess, like scope of the vision, right? The, the view, the perspective over to Hammerhall, a city in two realms. Now, if you're not familiar with Hammerhall, it is essentially the first city that was planted in the mortal realms when Sigmar opened the gates to, from Azir. It is located initially in Akshi. So basically the gates of Azir opened, they found a place in Akshi, secured it, built a fort around it, and within that fort, they built it around a realm gate that goes to Giran, the realm of life. And so essentially this massive city built itself on both ends of a massive, huge, stable realm gate. And when I say massive, like the story of AOS is kind of fast forwarded. It seems like many, many generations over time since like the founding of the actual story back in like 2015. But now we're talking about like an arcane megalopolis, tiered multiple wall sections. And what they do is essentially use the resources of each city. Now, of course, this place isn't really mentioned in the Broken Realm series, but things are not looking too great here either. So when we talk about Hammerhall, understand that I'm going to be distinguishing it between Hammerhall Akshi, which I might just call Akshi, uh, and Hammerhall Gyra, which is the same half of the city located in Gyran. Just a few points of interest here before we start diving into the stories of what's going on. Each of these cities has their own complete government, and then those governments work together. So for example, Hammerhall Akshi is the industrial powerhouse of the Grand Alliance Order. Right? They use the magma heat of Akshi uh, and the abundant amounts of like metals and stuff like that to make weapons, arms, shields, everything that they can. Maybe bringing some stuff in from Chaman, forging it here, and then sending it out to wherever it needs to be fought. Whereas Giran tends to be the breadbasket providing all of the food and most importantly aqua giranis the the magical realm water of giran that like is super crazy we'll talk about what it does for people here in another video but it's a very interesting kind of plot device and these two cities work in tandem to make sure other bastions of order have everything they need and so our, our focus kind of settles in hammerhall akshi and we meet up with characters that are very familiar to us callus and toll Essentially, inquisitorial investigators sent to see what is going on with these weird production quandaries that are happening in the foundry, specifically a district called Kindle Heights. For some reason, that entire district seems to just kind of be crashing in terms of its productivity, but there's not really a, an obvious reason as to why in terms of you know, there's no strikes going on, there's no equipment damage reported, nothing. And it's here that a very strange case begins to unfold. And I really do hope they flesh this out into a more complete novel. I would love to read it. Callus and Toll are, are great characters. I already have, I believe, two or three books. Please correct me down below if you can think, name all three of them. But two books for sure. Uh, and they're wonderful. But anyway, as Callus and Toll are investigating what's going on, they're noticing that a strange like wave of apathy and despondency to the point of death is like sweeping over this entire district. And I kind of get the image if you've seen the movie Firefly of um, they put this like toxin in the air and some people made them feral monsters and the other ones just sat there and died. It kind of just kind of seems like that. They just became morose, sad, despondent, and just kind of sat down and just could not get up. And at first they're looking at this like, okay, so it's a worker revolt, right? If nothing's going on and everyone's just kind of sitting, that's not really a crime. And then they started to notice that whatever was going on seemed to be infectious. So people started looking ill and then they would just sit down, be sad and, and not move. And if anyone came near them, they would do the same. So it's like, what is this disease of apathy? And so the city leaders who are constantly getting floods of information from both local and, you know, all their satellite locations, gosh, Hammerhall actually must have a ton they're realizing a pattern is happening and this becomes the opening part of what they know as the Shudder Blight Plague. A magical storm conjured by, they assume, the forces of Nurgle. 
it functions like a disease, it's making everybody despondent. Those are two like huge thumbprints of Nurgle and we know that we're actively ticking him off, so that makes sense. The math is adding up. And while the city is wrestling with all of these things going on, also the, the private advisors and the scryers and seers are beginning to sense and suspect that chaos is mounting a major counterattack to the forces of order. Because remember, if we think about the, the meta-narrative of Age of Sigmar as we know it, right, since it started with the Gates of Azir opening up, the forces of chaos as a united, loosely, front have received a real one-two punch. Okay, order came back in with the Realm Gate Wars, took a whole bunch of massive Realm Gates, disrupted all of their transportation, dominated several, like, massive fortresses. Like, they just, they came in and hard and wrecked things very fast and aggressively, making friends along the way. Before we saw a real good counterpunch from Chaos Forces, though, Nagash came in with the metal chair like this was a WWE wrestling match. And that whole side quest went down, right? So now Death is kind of the ascendant faction. Now the era of the beast began. Kragnos is going wild, but it's not happening here. It's not nearly as setting wide as the Necroquake was. I mean, life is blossoming everywhere, but it's not all like Gur, is what I'm saying. And when we talk about the size of the armies that Archeon has access to and knowing how much disruption came out of absolutely nowhere, I'm reminded of the phrase, I think it was a World War One quote, of like, the deployment of millions cannot be improvised or something like that. Like, this stuff takes time and they just keep getting knocked backwards. And so now what they're seeing is this is the chaos counteroffensive. But what shape this will take is a huge mystery at this point. So everyone's like on edge trying to isolate whatever is going on in Kindle Heights. And the scryers are like, something's coming, something's coming. They're saying this to all the political leaders and the political leaders are like, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what's going on with our neighbors, Hammer Hall Gyra. Like I said, two cities, two mayors working in tandem. Akshi is the industry, Gyra is the breadbasket, and the Shutter Blight Plague is here as well, specifically taking the form of a massive rainstorm. What we begin to see is that the things that are going on in Akshi are really just kind of warning signs of what's going on in Gyran. The Shutter Blight Plague is kind of passively sifting through and, and poisoning little tiny bits of Akshi, but it is a torrential downpour in Gyran. This rainstorm is bringing in this miasma of despondency, um, and it was started to creep over and infect all of the different various like, sections of Gyran. Again, it's like a huge Nurgle plague storm centered all around Hammerhall Gyra. And that is until Alariel saw what was happening and was like, "That's that just will not do, came down to the dead center of the storm and began her own rainstorm, this time raining healing water. So she didn't shut down the Nurgle spell, she just kind of started enacting her own counter one. What's really cool is that the book points out that she's not creating rain, she's actually like channeling water from a waterfall to go up into the sky and then sprinkle outwards, which I thought was kind of a cool image. Like that would make some pretty baller Lisa Frank art of just like redirecting a whole waterfall and spreading it over a nation. The, the problem is though is that her storm can't touch everything. Like if all you're doing is washing off the Nurgle stuff, well anything that pools water can potentially contain the contaminant. And so we get this kind of visual of, you know, caves and caverns and little repositories of water that you might not think anything of otherwise begin kind of collecting rotting flies in little clusters. So we know that it's not good. And while the leaders of Giran are dealing with this, the whole rainstorm, right? And they're just kind of getting back on their feet now that Alariel's turned her faucet on. They're getting weird reports from all over. Like, so just like Akshi, Giran has Dawnbringer like satellite cities that have gone out and tried to establish posts of their own. Well, up in the north, they're just getting these very odd reports. One of the cities up there, uh, they were some traders came to it, were looking around and found the entire city's inhabitants dead, butchered, and like half eaten. And there was a note with the name Sir Jerrion scribbled out. In fact, all around the border cities of Gairan, cities were going out. Not quite like this one. This was like a massacre of some kind, but these cities started to basically stop reporting in. 
Now, Axie's attack was not nearly as in your face, right? They were just catching some residual stuff that was going on at this point. The action is in Gairan. And so the leaders there kind of start to worry about what's going on. And they send out missives to all of the other existing satellite cities of Gairan and, and Hammerhall Gairan. Come back. Like, basically... All available soldiers, we need you to just withdraw. You can leave your stuff there. If it gets destroyed, it gets destroyed. Come back here, we need to re-fortify. Almost like saying we've overplayed our hand and we can't defend all of this. Stormcasts are there for sure, but they are a limited force relative to how many hordes of chaos exist. Decisions were made of like, we're gonna send missives to some places and not others, essentially leaving some to die to have, have them act sort of as like a holding measure so that other cities had time to evacuate. A rear guard action, that's what I was trying to think of. And these incredibly difficult decisions were made by the governor of Hammerhall Gyra herself, a woman named Lady Nadian Greenspur, the matriarch of Gyranus, which is the coolest name in all of Warhammer, by the way. And she herself fell into a deep depression. Because at this point, the blossoming that was supposed to happen has utterly and completely sputtered. But the problem is, the missives and the mandates that the Sigmar Church are putting out are now beginning to conflict with what the city leaders are seeing. Meaning, the city leaders are like, oh, we expanded our borders too fast. Okay, we need to fall back, reconsolidate, and we'll do it again. Kind of a thing. It's, it's a very common sense thing. But the church is there saying, no, we have a mandate, right? We have, we have a Sigmar manifest destiny. We got to get out there, dude. We got to like, and they just keep pushing crusades, just sending them out en masse. Some of them are getting bigger. They're realizing that more, um, I guess, armored convoys and that kind of stuff are going to work better in terms of having more military presence. And they're just kind of evolving with what's happening. So, for example, it's rumored that, that Hammerhall actually is looking to do one uber Dawnbringer crusade instead of a bunch of smaller ones basically looking to move an entire city and military garrison at the same time rather than pioneers who happen to have guards. Now that's actually where I'm going to end this video, just kind of setting the stage for what's happening. Like I said, uh, it fits firmly in the timeline, meaning it's it's after the events of Broken Realms, but it had to have been recent because the way that some of the characters were referring to the events of Broken Realms, it seemed very recent. As I said before, I do hope there is a Callus and Told novel. They're they're wonderful when it comes to finding like the little stories of intrigue within the mortal realm. So if you have a favorite one, please leave it in the comments down below to help some new readers out uh, and discover these guys. And the reason I chose to pause it here is because the way the book is laid out is we start with the limited perspective when it comes to Hammerhall, meaning these are the things that the people within the city are looking out and seeing. Hammerhall actually is doing fine other than this one industrial quarter having a weird kind of plague, but we can isolate that. Um, we're more worried about what's going on with our neighbors, and the neighbors over in Garan are like getting literally flooded with sadness, <laughs> and a god is actively there constantly trying to help, and it's still not enough. Weird things are happening. They're starting to have what I can imagine would be conflicts within the government and the church, and the whole thing just needs to recede a bit at a time where receding is kind of anathema to the plan. That being said, it doesn't help anybody if you just leave them all out there to die on their own. So I totally get it. Now, this series is unlike the others because the Broken Realms books, I felt told a much more linear narrative, meaning like they had characters in each book you know, introduced some characters, brought them all into a plot, and then kind of resolved them, if not by the end of that book, then by the end of the series. You know, where they are, how they are, such on, and so on. This, however, feels more like the first in a, a siege campaign book. Like, they're setting us up for one epic battle around Hammerhall, which is great because Hammerhall is the biggest producer of Dawnbringer Crusades, like, collectively from the two realms. And they're an epicenter, like I said, of industry and food and production and shipping and all these kinds of things. We're going to get into the stories on both ends. So... Rather than having like uh, each book have its own fluid narrative, this specific one, Dawnbringers 1, tells two stories. One story happening in Giran, the other in Akshi, and so videos 2 and 3 in this series are going to be those stories respectively. 
And then I'm going to do a follow-up video four that kind of condenses some of the lore tidbits that give us clues about the future into one video, wrapping it all up and kind of giving us some space to theory craft what's going on further in the series. So friends, thank you so much for being patient with me. I've been moving. I'm actually, uh, this is scheduled correctly, moving right now into my new home. So thank you so much for your patience with me. And uh, hopefully this series goes as well as I hope it will. Thank you all so much for hanging out and watching. And I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.